This is Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast talking today about the oft-repeated claim that stand-up comedians are our modern-day philosophers. This is Mark Lintemeyer exploring the nature of causality by taking a sledgehammer to a watermelon. <laughs> this is Erica Spires studying one of my favorite comedian philosophers, Steve Martin, who says, if you're studying geology, which is all facts, as soon as you get out of school, you forget it all. The philosophy you remember just enough to screw you up for the rest of your life. And I'm Brian Hurt. And I think when Socrates drank that cup of poison, it was pretty funny. And our special guest, Daniel Lobel, host of the Modern Day Philosophers podcast, which inspired this topic, and also a successful stand-up comedian and author of graphic novels about himself. That's right. Very egocentric. For our listeners, Mark was holding something up at the camera, which, like (laughs) prop comedy, is not going to work on a podcast. (laughs) It's called Fair Enough. That's the name of the series. It's true stories from my life turned into basically graphic novels, very much in the vein of the late, great Harvey P. Carr. And the third book is coming out for Thanksgiving, which is a Thanksgiving story. Mark, what are we talking about today? I'm trying to think if there's a segue that I can use to use the exchange we just had as an example or a potential example to evaluate. It's not that comedy is the same as philosophy, right? Because clearly, if you're just making puns, like, (laughs) okay, you're getting at some sort of In fact, some philosophers, any given thing I think of that humor does, like puns, yeah, there are philosophers that will write these whole treatises based on like the etymology of a word and kind of like you can really figure out what we mean by truth by looking at the Latin and then the Greek that it was derived from and you can see it it actually means the showingness or something, you know, and oh, okay, the truth is not some weird thing, it's just the showingness. But I think that if you're doing like full-on philosophy, You can't just stop at any given point, whereas with comedy, you can tread a lot of the same ground, but you can stop at the funniest point. In fact, you should stop at the funniest point. You can't just keep beating the horse in the way that you do in a philosophical text. Correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't there also words that were created by philosophers? Yeah, I'm never really sure because a lot of the time it's in a foreign language and they're just shoving words together. You don't know exactly whether that concatenation was implicit in the foreign language original separate terms. I'm trying to think of an English one offhand. Right, We kind of caught Mark and me between our areas of expertise because he studied philosophy yes. <laughs> and I studied linguistics, but I don't know how much we overlapped each other on that. There certainly are words that took on new meaning and in fact got their prime meaning as they were used by philosophers to the point where I'm guessing what their original intention was either was lost or it's not the first thing you think of. And whatever the broader context of id, ego, and superego might be, I think now people really go towards the the Freudian interpretation and what those mean in that specific context. I could be wrong. That is a great example because the ego was just ich in German, which is I. Like it means nothing more than me. (laughs) Or nothing more than me in Latin, right? But it's a thing now. Yeah, exactly. George Barclay, didn't he create a word? Uh, <laughs> clickety-clackety, clickety-clack, as we all. <laughs> I thought he did. I could be totally wrong, which is the whole premise of everything I do. <laughs> if you listen to my podcast, I don't really know. I just stumble my way through life and do my best, but sometimes I'm right. Barclay actually invented the term free thinker, calling somebody a free thinker, meaning that they're an atheist. There's something, that's probably not what you had in mind. But it still illustrates a certain point. Was that that comedians also make up words likewise? I'm sure comedians do make up words, usually by accident, because they lack decent vocabulary. Well, I stumbled across the word humble brag actually was invented by the author who wrote the book Humble Brag, this idea that, you know, well, I was watching the news while I was on the treadmill, humble brag. Would you count that? That's a compound word, right? Yeah, well, that's what I was just saying. It seemed like Freethinker and the German ones that I had in mind, that a lot of those, it's the same kind of thing. Well, I guess the distinction is... With free thinker, he assigned a new definition to existing words. With humble brag, it's still the same definition for the same two words. He's just shoved them together into one word. But they describe a thing that didn't have a word describing it before. Okay, fair point. He's the expert on this, I guess. Okay, well, I, I'll defer to him then. I, I... <laughs> I'm the linguist, so I'll say everyone's right. <laughs> Mark Meeting the will say no one knows anything. <laughs> Can you tell us more, Daniel, about like why you're our guy today? What is your particular expertise in comedy and philosophy? 
So I've been doing stand-up comedy for close to 17 years. So that's Congrats. a long time. Thank you. That is a long time for a brutal field, right? Yes. I'm hanging in and I'm hanging tough. That's great. I got into comedy not for any profound reason. I think because I wanted attention. I walked into an open mic once when I was nearly 16 years old. I signed up and the guy who ran the open mic said, okay, you're on in two. Do you need to set up an instrument or anything? I'm like, oh, no, no, no. He's like, so you're not a musician? No. He's like, so you're a poet? No. And he said, okay, so this is a musician and poetry open mic. What are you here to do? (laughs) And I said, I don't know. I didn't actually think about it. I just wanted to go up there. He says, you can't just go up there. He said, you have to have something. I'm like, I have a funny story that happened to me earlier this week. He goes, uh... I'll put you last. So he bumped me down to the bottom of the list. And then I went up last and I got laughs and everybody said, good job. And uh, I said, when's the next one? And they said, next week. And uh, it continued on like that for a very long time. At some point, I realized, okay, this has got to be about something more than attention for me at this point because it needed to have some meaning. I stopped and I evaluated like who were the comedians that I really liked. And at the time, Patrice O'Neill came to mind. George Carlin, I think Bill Burr. I thought, what is the thread between these people? And I thought about it, and I said, well, they're all saying something. In fact, they're all philosophizing up there. I used to work for Jackie Mason, and he introduced me to George Carlin. And so there was a period of my life when I was friends with both these guys, and I'd be on the phone with them, hanging out with them, and it was very cool and surreal and this weird moment in my life where I'm hanging out with two of the greatest comedians, right? George Carlin died, and Jackie Mason called me up that morning, and he said, you know, we lost more than a comedian with Georgie Carlin. We lost a modern-day philosopher. While I'd heard that term thrown around to describe comedians before, it never stuck with me as much as it did when he said it was very poignant. I said, that's what we are at our height, at our best. I still believe there's George Carlin and then everybody else. And I don't mean any disrespect to... Many greats that are included in the everybody else, but I've never seen anybody take this art to that high a level. And you could argue, no, Richard Pryor did better this or that. That's a matter of taste. But for me, I think George Carlin really did the most with the art form. And if he's a modern day philosopher, then that's what I want to be. Maybe Mark, you can chime in here too. What is a philosopher and is that actually different than a comedian? I mean, obviously, I think you could be both, but what actually makes somebody a philosopher and not just someone who talks about philosophy? So if you had asked me this a couple of years ago, I would have said, obviously, we have modern day philosophers. They're the academics. (laughs) They write papers. They are systematic. It can't just stop at the funny part. Having to be funny is effective restriction. It would keep you from examining the truth to the degree that you should. But having gotten to this point, I'm now feeling like the question is more like maybe something has gone wrong. There's a reason why the average person can't name any living philosophers. We've kind of lost the pulpit. Like it maybe, you know, if you go back and you're, you're talking about ancient Greece, you're talking about actually, frankly, some places in Europe even now, <laughs> but certainly like Nietzsche was just a pop phenomenon at the time in a way that, yeah, we've got Sam Harris, we've got Jordan Peterson, we do have some people in that space. But in terms of the way that they would relate to people and the way that their ideas took hold, and it does seem more like a verbal, in many cases, art form. You know, if you're talking about Epicurus going around and teaching his or Socrates, the big model, the number of people that are actually going to read things is always limited. So if you're talking about who is voicing ideas that actually make regular people think about stuff, then, well, we have a number of categories of people that do that now. Politicians are mostly voicing cliches and got to keep on message. And then we've got a bunch of hucksters. We have, I don't know, there's just something weird about the whole idea of a crowd of people not talking to each other. They're paying attention to one person who's up there. And I understand if the one person's up there creating art, like and everybody's marveling at the art, like that's one thing. But if they're just talking, what's going on there? This whole idea of the purveyor of wisdom and then all the rest of us are listening to that and being enlightened by that. Like, 
that's either religious figures or other hucksters that are doing modern things that they might call philosophy or something, but it's sort of more related to religion when you get down to it, maybe a new kind of religion. And so this hybrid, the comedian who is doing something, is creating art, you know, creating a well-crafted joke is similar to creating a song, but they're also the kind of Daniel's talking about here. They're also putting forward ideas. So I'm willing to say that like, okay, there was a branching off since the time of Socrates and the Carlins and the Louis C.K.'s and the Bill Burr's and the many other followers in that tradition are one legitimate branch of that. Mark, I'm going to just say that looking at things like TED Talks, there still is, I think, an appetite for people to just get knowledge from someone who's talking. What's really incredible about comedians is they are doing that and also making us laugh, right? There's two things going on at the same time that you could actually be philosophizing and doing something that's really hard, which is to get a laugh out of a room. I don't know how to do that, but when it happens, it's really something to see. Is the comedy part incidental? Like, Daniel, the way you were just describing your journey is like, okay, you started by, I just want to be up there in this position <laughs> and having people look up at me and listen to what I have to say. That it really came from that spot. But then when you're like, okay, what do I actually want to say? Then like, that is the point of philosophical reflection. You're kind of figuring out like, what do I actually think about stuff? And if you have nothing to do, but I mean, you could be like a Jackie the Joke Man Martling that sees, you know, the history of comedy and I will just write jokes, jokes, jokes. What is the structure of jokes? I am a scientist of the joke. But the other side of that is where the joke part is almost incidental. You're using that craft to draw people in, but you're really about saying the stuff that you want to say about making these observations. And what makes it funny is not just that it was a setup and a well-timed punchline, but it was that skill used on top of something that seemed insightful. He's saying the things that I think I'd never thought about things that way before. This makes me feel better about the state of the world, you know, whatever. How does that reflect on, Daniel, your being locked in your own mind, deciding what you're going to say. And then through your podcast, Modern Day Philosophers, talking to, what, a 100 plus comedians about how they do the same thing. Right. I think there are these different levels of what you can do with this. You know, it brought to mind, and I guess George Carlin's a big part of this at this point for me. I had him on my college radio show, which was my original podcast, and he said something. He said, you know, some of us are comedians, but some of us are artists, and there is a difference. I think you can be an artist of the joke, but what I found through my podcast is that not all comedians are modern-day philosophers. You can just want to make people laugh and have nothing behind it. For me, that burned out. I think there are some people that have an endless pit for attention-seeking. And as somebody who has a narcissistic comic book about himself, I can't say that I'm not in that camp, right? But not to the degree that I've seen out there. And maybe that's just my own rationalizing it for myself to feel better. But I don't feel like I need that much attention as much as I feel gratified by being able to spread my views of the world and share and grow in my understanding of it by using this art form. And that need for attention itself becomes a source of philosophical reflection, of, of psychological reflection of like, what do I actually want? You know, because you get it. You can make a, a room with people laugh, and then it's like, is that enough? I don't know. It seems like it's one of those temptations that, as the Stoics say, you know, turn out to be, you get accustomed to it, you, you want more, you find it's not enough. One of those things that is not all it's cracked up to be. And that sort of seems that at whatever level you get, even the most famous comedians, they might find like making a whole stadium full of people laugh. Like that's just, what is the point? It's not even enough anyway. It's, there's something fleeting about it. Right. One of the things I remember and it wasn't such a conscious decision, but I was asking my guests before Modern Day Philosophers when I did my podcast back in college, and I had all these comedians on, I kept asking them, especially the older ones, what keeps driving you? What motivates you at this point? And I was dying to know because I was dying inside as a comedian. I just felt like I don't know how much longer I can sustain this. I don't care anymore. And I didn't understand why I didn't care, and I didn't understand what was missing, and people would just be like, I like it. I like making people laugh. And I'd be like, uh, that can't be it. That can't be enough. And I feel the way about comedy as I feel, I mean, the things I think about a lot are food, religion, comedy. And I feel the same way about all of them in that it can be junk or it can be substance. You know, like 
Some people use food as drugs, and then some people use food as nutrition. Some people use laughter as a drug. As a comedian, they go up there and they just want that high. And some people use it as a platform to share ideas. And the same is true as religion. Some people just like to get involved in religion and because it's like an escapism from their life, and some people use it to be inspired. So everything has a good and bad way to use it. When comedy is being used in its highest function, I feel, you know, at that point, you're sharing ideas, you're philosophizing. I don't think the highest function of comedy is just, you know, how many laughs can I get? How much drugs can I absorb? It's got to be about something more than that. Otherwise, you're just an addict. I agree with you. But before we proceed, we must stop and attend to commercial matters, which means I must tell you about keeps. Are you a fellow? Nearly one out of two people are fellows. Two out of three of us fellows will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35. If this is something that is a concern to you, if you are a head model, if you live in a cold climate and keep losing your hat, well, you might want to look into keeping the hair you have, and there are established FDA-approved advancements in science that Keeps can hook you up with without leaving your home that are up to 90% effective at reducing and stopping further hair loss, which works better if you start it sooner, and many men even experience hair regrowth with Keeps treatments. This is not the kind of thing that I ever wanted to bring up in any of my doctor's office visits about allergy medicine or whatever else was bugging me. So I never looked into this, but with Keeps, you could visit a doctor online, you get a prescription tailored to you, you could ask that doctor as many questions as you want, you can do your own research, and you can get the medication delivered to your home, and Keeps treatments start at just $10 a month, and for a limited time, you can get your first month free. So I used the site, it was very easy to sign up, they send you the products, discreetly packaged, there's videos of how to apply the stuff on your head, and plenty of post-mailing communication to make sure your concerns are met. So it is risk-free to go just check this out if this is something you've thought about researching but hadn't gotten around to it. So find out why Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors and 100,000 men trust Keeps for their hair loss prevention medication. Go to keeps.com slash pop to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash P-O-P. Now let's get back to the discussion. What Daniel said makes me want to ask a question to both of you, Mark and Erica, being performers, wondering if, whether it's music, as you both do, or acting, more Erica, do you need to be getting something different or special other than just getting the admiration or the attention of your audience? Or are you going for some sort of transcendent moment as an actor or musician? Because those are different kinds of things, but you're still the center of attention and on stage. It has to be more. It's not sustainable for long term unless I think of something more. And sometimes that long term is just like the point of one particular show might be, oh, this is just going to be fun because I just need it. Like, that's all I need is it just needs to be fun. Not only does it help with nerves, but it just helps with my own personal psyche to know that I'm not just doing it for myself or at least convince myself I'm not doing it for myself, you know, and that it's not a stupid profession to be in, that it's absolutely essential. And maybe it's not a profession, you know, like theater in particular, it's not like a big money making venture, either for me or for anybody producing it, right? Just like we were talking to my brother about operas the same way, but there's something about it that we feel is essential that whether it's helping people express themselves or helping people see part of themselves in the performance that you give and the story that you're telling, I do believe that it can change people and make us more compassionate, empathetic, and connected people. And I think being a mindful performer, whether you're a comedian or an actor or a musician, is really helpful. It doesn't mean you're always going to get it across by any means, but at least the goal is there. Mark, are you going to be just as high-minded or are you going to bring us back to earth here? Well, I want to use my response to push things back to Daniel because I have often thought that I don't know how I if I would cope very well as a touring musician. I like working up a new set, performing it in front of people a few times and it gets cleaner and cleaner every time and there's something very satisfying about that. But definitely I get tired of songs and I get rid of them from the set. Whereas it seems like the typical comedian trajectory, which is maybe not the way that Dave Chappelle or Louis C.K. does it, certainly not Bill Burr, is that you are crafting a set, getting these jokes 
sharper and sharper, articulating your points in a more and more effective way over like a year. And then it's like, okay, now I'll do my special, I'll record my album, whatever, and then wipe the slate clean probably and start a new thing. So how is the idea that you're meaningfully conveying something to an audience, but you've said this time and time and time before? Like I could not do the same podcast time and time and time again. I have to have new content, new things to say. This is the kind of one of the things that's been a barrier between me and even trying out stand up comedies. I just, I want us to talk more off the cuff. What is your approach there, Daniel? Or, or how do you see this interacting with what we've been talking about, about being philosophical as comedy? Ideally, as a comedian, I think what you're doing is you're trying to craft a set that's really good, really strong, conveys your ideas, conveys your punchlines gets the point across, and you want to do that as smoothly and as effectively as possible. So you run the same material again and again until you get it to that point. You're crafting the set, so to speak, right? Then you record it, get it out there, and move on. And I've seen many guys that are doing the same set now that they were doing 10 years ago. And what that does is it freezes them at a moment in their life that they're endlessly living in. And this is where comedy can be a dangerous thing because that limits your growth intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, however you want to look at it. So if you're proclaiming this thing to be true about yourself, in a way, you're actually making it true about yourself. So even if it was at one point true and now it no longer is, to some extent, you are prolonging its truth. We try not to live a lie, you know? It's weird. Sometimes I've seen people go on stage and they talk about their girlfriend, but they've broken up with their girlfriend. And there's a disconnect between those two realities. And I don't know if the audience knows, but I think they can tell because it's coming from this insincerity. You know, there's a lot of reasons why I've thought that comedians are not modern day philosophers. And one of the things is if you're not trying to grow and push yourself as a person, as an artist, you get stagnant, you stop philosophizing, you get stuck in a routine. That's when people say, hey, why don't you do your routine? You know, That's a routine. That's not even art anymore. You're just punching in and punching out. Imagine you know, Van Gogh painting the same painting over and over again, mass producing it. It's not really creativity anymore at that point. It's just reproduction. So is there something about philosophy in creating something new, just relating it to philosophers, are they always thinking of something new? Are they ruminating on the same ideas and spinning new things out of that? Or is it about pushing beyond their boundaries in the same way that you're hoping that a great comedian would? It depends who you're talking about. It does seem like usually philosophers, they have a philosophy. They have, this is like a core of stuff they believe, and they're working out from that and working at better ways to articulate it especially a public philosopher, you know, if you're like a prominent atheist and I believe that I should evangelize, then you're going to be giving a lot of the same arguments again and again. And you, like you tweak them to particular audiences or to particular situations, or you engage in debates. A lot of philosophers don't like that kind of <laughs> evangelist. Like that's not real philosophy. You're not doing fresh thinking, but even like the most high minded, respected written philosophers, like it's going to be very rare it depends how much they write. Let's put it this way. So some people really like Robert Persig. So this is somebody that wrote Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and like one other book. And some people really think just he's the be all and end all. And so he just, he wrote it once. I'm getting to this primal truth that influenced a lot of people. Most academic philosophers, no, they might have their classic work, but then there's probably like a whole bunch of articles that were leading up to that later books that are kind of playing over the same theme. So like John Rawls is one of the biggest 20th century philosophers that there was. And he's kind of, you know, his books are thick. It's not like he's repeating one idea over and over again. He's using his philosophical skills to address a lot of distinct issues. Well, I think a key thing that's happening, and this happens, I think, across academia, is they're not going to be contradicting themselves later on as a rule. They're going to try to support their earlier works and maybe develop them further, where what Daniel was talking about with comedians, especially because it relates to their own life, they're developing as people and as adults. And they may say, you know, 10 years ago, I thought this, now I'm a father or I had a tragedy or whatever. And now I think this about things and they really can do a complete 180 or go in a new direction in a way that I don't know that a philosopher or really any academic would tend to. 
I mean, this might be a problem with philosophers as well as comedians, but I think sometimes what I see is that comedians will alter their philosophy to adapt to the way they want the world to be. I mean, I think there's a lot of groupthink in comedy because it's entertainment. It's part of the entertainment industry. I've tried to separate myself as much from that as possible. I try not to care what show business says or what Hollywood tells you is ethical or right or whatever, and tried to make my own assessments. You know, I had this interesting thought the other day when I was rewatching Chappelle's special and Bill Burr's recent special, thinking in the context of this show, about how we love comedians being politically incorrect. Bill Maher had a show called Politically Incorrect, right? But in order to assess what's politically incorrect, we have to look at what's politically correct, in any culture at any given time. So what's politically correct is basically what is considered correct by the culture, right? By pop culture. So whatever pop culture tells you is politically correct, if you go against that, you're being politically incorrect, which is why people went up in arms when Dave Chappelle expressed views that might be seen as conservative, right? That's limiting philosophically, I think. Because if you want to be politically incorrect, then you're almost painted into a corner of going against a certain narrative. And if not, you're sort of just stuck in that narrative. That doesn't leave a lot of room for independent thought. Well, that's really interesting. I was just thinking about being PC or not being PC could be a choice that people are making as a reaction to what the PC world is, or people can just be PC or not based on, well, I've always been this, this is the philosophy that I, I guess if your goal is to be a philosopher comedian. You don't necessarily care if you're being PC or not because you're just going to stick to the philosophy that you've set out for yourself and that's your goal and you're going to be funny within that whether or not it's PC. That's sort of what I strive to do, you know? Right. Mark, you had brought up Hannah Gatsby. Yeah, I thought the Nanette special by Hannah Gatsby has gotten a lot of press recently. It's kind of been an interesting test case of, of this. Hannah said in this interview, you know, what comedy is, it's being an outsider. So if you're worried that comedy is so delicate that people can't question it, then harden up. And then she's asked about, well, is the audience too PC? And she said, no, comedians are too sensitive. If something as benign as political correctness can kill comedy, then comedy's already dead. I agree with that. So she was expressing in her special kind of what you were describing, Daniel, that she had come up with these routines, self-deprecating things about her appearance, about her being a lesbian, then would tell these again and again and again at different clubs. And she said specifically, like, some of the anecdotes, she would have to stop at the funny part. She would have to, you know, obey the laws of comedy. And that was actually falsifying what actually happened. See, she didn't have to. She chose to. That's the distinction, I would say. She got caught up in a narrative. These are pitfalls that a lot of comedians fall into. They get caught up in a routine or a narrative or a character. And those things all limit your growth potential comedically in my estimation. But she sort of had to stop, Daniel, if she wanted it to be a joke, because the part where she gets beat up, I mean, it's not a joke anymore. No, she just had to be more creative with how to express that comedically. Do you have any examples of how you've done something similar in your work? Something that was probably very hurtful to you, but you didn't stop at the comedy. Given how much of your work is autobiographical and doing that through the, like, this seems really appropriate, actually, (laughs) aimed at you, you know, with the comic, too. I'm about to be a father. I've On stage recently, I've been talking about how terrifying that is to me and how people come up to me and they're like, you must be so excited. What are you doing to prepare for it? You must be so excited. And I go, well, what I've been doing is pretending that it's not happening. You know, (laughs) (laughs) I just pretend that nothing's going on at all. And uh, my wife gained a little weight. You know, I just don't. want to face the reality of it. And that gets big laughs because it resonates true with a lot of people, I guess. It's honest, but it's also painful. And I kind of get into that a little bit, into that pain of being a father. And and it's not a happy thought to say that, right? But it's an honest thought. And it's in your delivery. It's in the structure of how you're saying it. You can talk about being raped and make it funny. That is one of the great challenges of being a comedian, if you choose to take it. I'm not saying everyone raped should make it funny. Sometimes that's just deflecting away from the pain, and that's not healthy at all. And that's another pitfall comedians do, is where rather than face something, they just would rather deflect and use comedy. But 
if you're really coming at it as an artist, I think you work things out, be it in therapy or however, and then you also bring it to the stage. Not you use the stage as your therapy, but you use the stage to convey the ideas that brought you into therapy or what you learned. Like, I go to therapy. I deal with these things on a real level. I'm not there cracking jokes with my therapist. You're not trying out your new set on your therapist? Right. I try to be honest about things in life. That's why I switched from Danny to Daniel. Danny was a character. That wasn't me. That's not my name. It's something I came up with. It sounded like a showbiz character. Danny Lobel, you know, it's like a name in lights type of thing. And that's not what I want to be anymore. Nothing against lights, but I just, uh, <laughs> you know, I just didn't want that wall between who I am and who I present to the audience. I think Emo Phillips is a brilliant comedian, and I hope anybody listening to this doesn't take this as anything other than, you know, I, I think he's great. Sometimes I think, and I could be wrong, that he's limited himself because he's in this character. And he's been in this character since the 1980s, and he doesn't do interviews as Emo Phillips. Like he used to come on my radio show podcast back in the day, but only in the character. And then afterwards, I get to meet the real guy for a little bit, and I was dying to interview him, but he wouldn't do it. Rodney Dangerfield, one of my favorites, always in the character. A little less so than Emo, but even still, you create a character, you then have to live into the reality of that character. It limits you artistically in some way. Now, that might not matter. There's very few people who have ever walked the earth as funny as Rodney Dangerfield and what he contributed to the world of comedy. And emo, too. You know, you can't take anything away from that. Is it philosophical? That'd be a tough argument, I think. Stephen Colbert did, a, I think, probably a very unique thing, right? When he went away from his, what would you call his character? Shtick. <laughs> his right. shtick, yeah. yeah. Like, he did his shtick, and he did it very, very well, and we all loved it. And then he's like, no, I'm just going to be me, the actual Stephen Colbert now. And now it's up to the audience to decide if that's better. My take is it is, but some people might say otherwise. Daniel, do you think the comedians who really just do straight comedy, the joke tellers or the characters like Emo Phillips, do they have more of a burden to actually be funny or universally funny in a way that those who are also philosophizing, they may not make everybody laugh or they may know that they're going to be off-putting during part of their routine and maybe at other times get laughs, but know that, yeah, this is not going to suit everyone's taste. I think the idea that Mark brought up at the beginning, which I think was a really interesting distinction between philosophers and comedians, is that we are going for the laugh. If you're trying to convey ideas that you think might be difficult to come across to a certain audience that you're speaking to, I think it's still your responsibility as a comedian to be funny. Because I don't believe in false advertising. I think if you tell people to come out to laugh, they should laugh. This, I've given a lot of thought on the Hannah Gatsby controversy is... Was it funny? Was it comedy? Was it just spoken word? I don't know. I think what she did was unique and special and great. Was it comedy? I don't know. There were certainly comedic elements to it, right? It may have been a one-woman show. I don't know if you have to categorize things where you put them, but it certainly blurred the lines, which is what I think intimidated some people. And do I have to laugh at something for it to be comedy? Or if other people are laughing and I'm not getting it, is it still comedy or isn't it? I watched a lot of specials in preparation for this discussion, and I sat in angered silence through some of it, so I don't know. Well, that's the big question that's, in my opinion, destroying comedy when people answer it a certain way. I think no. I think the answer is absolutely not. You don't have to find it funny for it to be comedy. In fact, if everybody found it funny, it probably sucks. <laughs> it's saying nothing. What is it? If I go up there and I tell a joke, a pretty benign joke, right, about my dog, just a silly little anecdote about my dog, like I have one I used to do about how I take my dog out for a walk, and he can just pee everywhere. And meanwhile, I'll be like dying to use a bathroom, and I'm jealous, and he'll pee right on my neighbor's lawn. But if I did that, you know, it's a sex crime, you know? So it's just like why that's funny is almost this weird thing of being jealous of a dog peeing, right? It's a benign joke. Now, somebody in the audience could have just lost their dog that morning of 20 years, right? And I hate this word, but it could be triggering for them that I brought up my great relationship with my living dog. Do I have to be conscientious of that potential? Now, where's the line? What if I made a joke about rape and somebody in the audience was raped? 
Do I have to worry that somebody in the audience was raped? Or do I have to look at, like, is this joke going to make the most people laugh? Or is this going to offend more people? And I think that's where you gauge where something is or isn't funny, is you give it to the audience, and you have them respond to you, and they tell you yes or no. And you take a sampling of you know a bunch of different audiences. And if it isn't funny, they'll let you know. And if you continue to do it, I think that's the definition of insanity, right? You just keep doing the same thing, expecting different results. But well, that's that would be the definition of self indulgence. That like you feel like I have to express this thing in this way, and if you people don't like it, then fuck you. You know, maybe I could be satisfied with like that. Two people think it's the funniest goddamn thing they've ever seen, and like that's the truth I was hitting toward. Mm-hmm. And maybe only these people have that sensibility that can get that. It does seem like that that's one difference, you know, of course, between writing and being in front of an audience that you get that immediate feedback that could be stifling that like you don't get the immediate feedback that you wanted. And so you don't continue to build it. I just wonder if like Zach Galifianakis's Between Two Ferns thing, which is hilarious, but it's not in front of an audience. And you could see that kind of routine failing to connect, like being actively unfunny in a way that then makes comedians, people who think about comedy, laugh. Like, that can be a fairly narrow audience. It just, I could see that you wanting to flesh something out in a way that, like, you know, it's just like if I posted all of my thoughts immediately to the internet, to Twitter, and have people say, well, that's fucking stupid. Like, okay, well, that <laughs> just makes that grind to a stop before I have the chance to dig the hole deeper <laughs> in a way that might eventually come up with water. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess in your example, the Twitterverse is its own kind of thing. I don't know if it really reflects an accurate sampling of society. But just to go with the broader theme, yes. And to add something, going back to what I was saying, what I think kills comedy is this idea that it has to be so universal. Is this idea that it has to be funny to everybody and account for everybody's feelings. First of all, comedy was never supposed to account for your feelings at all. It's supposed to change your feelings, and sometimes that hurts. If your feelings are hurt, that's something. Sometimes that's a good thing. Growing pains is a thing. Going back to my example, I purposely went for an extreme example with rape. I don't have any rape jokes because I haven't found an angle that I think is hilarious with rape. But if I did, I would certainly try it. You don't really know the effect you're having on people. Somebody in the audience might have been raped and talked about it in therapy ad nauseum. And everyone comes up to them because it's gotten around and they're constantly, oh, I'm so sorry, the rape, and they're so delicate and sensitive around them. And it can be incredibly refreshing for that person to finally see somebody make jokes about it and laugh about it. And it could actually help them put that chapter of their life to bed and be like, okay, I feel like I can finally laugh again about these very dark things that happened to me and move on with my life rather than maintaining this thing on this altar of sensitivity. The secret that I can't talk about kind of thing. And now all of a sudden it's out in the open and and we're laughing about it. Did you watch the Bill Burr or the Chappelle where Chappelle is like, I'm what you call a victim blamer. Yes, I did. Yeah, you like that? Honestly, if you would ask me the same question maybe three years ago, I would have had a totally different answer for you. I would think that people take things too seriously and that people should laugh more at everything. And even though I personally still feel that way for myself, I can understand why people were offended by Chappelle. I can understand why people have been offended by Louis C.K., even though I always thought he was hilarious. God rest his soul. (laughs) You know what I mean? So personally, I still find a lot of that funny, but it's hard in today's lens for me to even laugh at it, even knowing that at my core, I'm like, I think that's funny, but then I worry how it's affecting other people. I think that's something that's changed in me is that I actually have become a bit more empathetic to people different than myself. You try to be responsible as best as you can. I would hope you're not going up there and preaching hate, right? Even bad people are usually coming from a good place, but you hope that your good place matches up with the universe. You know, you, you hope that you're coming from a place of morality And then based on that, you add comedy. Right. Even within philosophy, you have people who are kind of doing almost science, right? I'm trying to establish truth. I'm trying to participate in this social enterprise with other academic philosophers that will establish some things as true and can be used going forward. And then there are essayists. You know, they're still being very philosophical. They're getting at important truths for individual lives. Like, this is what I think comedy is doing a version of. 
just the examples that you were giving is relating something important to your experience and relating that to another individual in the crowd. Then just thinking about that, that kind of makes a lot of sense of Hannah Gadsby. And I kind of agree with you that maybe she was not giving a test of like, does comedy work? <laughs> she was demonstrating patterns she had fallen into in the way she was doing comedy and that like it wasn't ringing true anymore and she ends up just ranting just ends up being enraged for a while and saying like there are serious things in the world and as you pointed out like this is not universally agreed upon but and this is a topic for another day but everything can be converted into comedy now whether you should or should not is a separate issue but like gallows humor is a primary form of humor the people who are like on death row they probably joke a lot Mm -hmm. Like, insofar as they have any spirit left in them to joke at all, right? That's why it's called gallows humor. The people who are involved in these horrible things, people who are at, at war, who are in these terrible situations, humor serves a function for them. It's a release of tension. Yes. But that's a very different thing than trying to state truth. And so we also looked at George Carlin, like his last special, It's Bad For Ya, is a really great example of his kind of way of philosophizing. But a lot of it is also ranting. It's ranting about how corrupt the world is, how stupid everybody is. And I'm sure that's him getting out. He's exaggerating, right? He even makes jokes about like, oh, because I'm making such a logical argument here, right? He knows he's not making a logical argument. He's not, and in fact, what I hate about the idea of comedy as philosophy is people who then see that and say, oh, I guess I should be a libertarian. I guess I should never vote anymore because everything is corrupt. No, no, no. There are things that I want you to read <laughs> if you're going to actually investigate that as a serious philosophy. But as a way of getting something off your chest of, you know, not necessarily a serious political commentary. Like this is the great thing about comedy that they can use the tools of philosophy of tools of expressing truth, but they don't have to go all the way. They can stop. It sometimes is just more fun to stop at the funny part. Cause it, right. If you're having a complete emotional expression about say a tragedy that happened, whether to you or to the world, it's not just going to be the joke, right? Of course you're going to then stop and say, but of course, you know, and you're going to express all the serious thoughts you have about it too. But getting just the funny part out there, like, is a valuable part of the service, perhaps. But it's just, I wouldn't want people to think, like, that that's a treatise, and that's what even the comedian really thinks about that. What's tricky about this is that a lot of philosophers also use irony, some of the best ones. Nietzsche, definitely. Socrates, definitely. Kierkegaard, like, made a whole study of this. And so you might read a whole treatise by them and still, like, not really know what they think. Like, they're kind of trying out this idea, churning it around, experimenting with it. So it's just not necessarily that any kind of philosophical expression is a semi-scientific, pre-scientific attempt to state facts. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. man, you just blew my socks off, Mark. <laughs> I know, with a few minutes left, I'd like to open up this can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> I think those were some great distinctions and things that we definitely need for this conversation. It just got me thinking about, okay, then it must be about the intention. It's the intention of, do I want to get something out there that's bigger than the joke? Absolutely. It's junk food or nutrition. What are you going to do? You have the ingredients. You have the kitchen. What are you going to make? And it's each person's individual decision whether or not they want to um, make philosophy on stage. But are all comedians modern-day philosophers, in my assessment? No. Are most of them? No. Are some of them? A select few are, you know? And that's why you're going to have a rating system for your own podcast. <laughs> so, 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 modern day philosophers asterisk. At the end of the, everyone, I hit a bell if they're a modern day philosopher. <laughs> and we've got one, folks, and some confetti falls down from the, the scoring. It's like a rating of uh, the guy who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul up to uh, Socrates. I'm so glad right. you said up to and not down from. <laughs> oh my gosh, Erica, that would have been shameful. <laughs> All right. Thanks for this discussion, Daniel. Obviously, there's a lot more we could say about this. Maybe we'll talk to you again some other time, but folks should go Maybe. and listen to you that means I didn't do talking a great to job. people at, on your Modern Day Philosophers <laughs> podcast where you relax and really get into it with these folks. And they're certainly, whether you want to consider them philosophers or merely artists of some sort or just more thoughtful than the average celebrity, there's a lot of awesome discussions on there. Thank you. And thanks for saying that. And I, I'll add this disclaimer. I tell people this, if you want a great podcast about philosophy, listen to The Partially Examined Life. If you want to hear some comedians stumble through some philosophical quotes and 
have some cool <laughs> conversations. Check out Modern Day Philosophers. Don't come here expecting to my podcast expecting partially examine life because then I get angry people writing in. <laughs> I am not a philosophy expert. I like playing with philosophical ideas and I like to bring out ideas philosophically from comedian guests. That's what you'll be getting if you come to my show. Sorry. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you guys very much for a great and thoughtful conversation. Absolutely. ModernDayPhilosophers.net And check out FairEnoughComic.com Bye, everybody! That's a wrap. Bye! Bye. Thank Bye. you. Pretty Much Pop is part of the Partially Examined Life Podcast Network, and it's also presented by OpenCulture.com. Get more Pretty Much Pop at PrettyMuchPop.com. Get bonus content for every episode at Patreon.com slash PrettyMuchPop.